Hello and welcome back to Highway to Hoover, a production of SEC Extra over at D1Baseball.com. I'm your host, Joe Healy, joined as always by my good friend and co-host, Mark Etheridge. We are continuing our series of SEC team preview podcasts, and today we're taking it down to the Magnolia State. We're going to preview Mississippi State and talk about the Bulldogs and talk about how likely or unlikely we feel it is this could be a bounce back season for State. I, I don't think... I, I don't think we're uh, telling any secrets here when we say that it's feels like a big year for state yeah. um, coming off of the, the years they've had. So we will dive into all of that in just a second. But first, I have to let you know that this episode of Highway to Hoover and every episode of Highway to Hoover is brought to you by PitchLogic, the system used by players, coaches, scouts and instructors at all levels of play from youth leagues to the big leagues. The easy to use and affordable technology makes the platform accessible to every player at every level. All the metrics and features used at the highest level. See pitchlogic.com for more information. All right. Uh, you know, like I alluded to, Mark, another, you know, back to back tough seasons for state. They're coming off of mm-hmm. 27 and 26 overall, uh, nine and 21 in the league. That's their second season in a row of just nine wins in SEC play. The saving grace, of course, at least last year, is that they did finish ahead of Ole Miss. So there was, <laughs> there was yeah. that. But uh, another, Another tough year. And, you know, you and I, at this time a year ago, we were sitting here talking about, you know, they're going to be better. It's just a matter of how much better. And then, you know, if you squint hard enough, I guess you could find reasons they were better. At the they, end of the year, they were better. Right. It's just I mean, the, the, to, to get to that point that you, know, you did have to squint. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I wrote this in, in our preseason snapshot that the Mark and I were putting together for Mississippi State that, you know, in 2022, they lost something like their last 11 SEC games. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, last year they were competitive till the end, won a series against LSU, fought hard that last weekend against A&M trying to get to Hoover. So, yeah, you may have to squint, but you you can see reasons why it was a little bit better, but still the result was what it was. And so I guess my first question, Mark, if I were to tell you, mm-hmm. um, if I were to just have a magic eight ball and say, Hey, guess what? You know, state bounces back next year and they, they not only get into a regional, but they look like a team that could host, you know, Um, what would you assume happened? They pitched so much better. That was the deal last year. I mean, injuries were a problem. Just guys underperforming. That, that was a problem. New pitching coach, um, you know, Justin Parker's in there now. Um, it's not, nothing against Scott Foxhall, but it just it just you know, ran its course apparently, and it just wasn't getting the results you needed. Great guy, just didn't work um, last couple of years. So I, I do think that if Mississippi State gets to where they where they want to be, it's because you know guys like Nate Dome and Gerangelo Sanja and you know the the transfers that they brought in that we'll get into in a few minutes all of those guys kind of elevated and as a result that offense that was you know that wasn't really the problem last year maybe it wasn't the best in the league but it was pretty good and and at times it was really good um it it continued its ascension and i think that's that's the key right you you have to pitch at a certain level and then you have to hit at a certain level. And Mississippi State hasn't done both of those in the last two years. And if, if they can do that, then, oh, my goodness. I mean, they're right back, you know, in the in that mix where if you get a few breaks and, you you, you know, things go your way, then all of a sudden you're you're contending and you're, you're doing all those things that you talked about. Yeah, it's it's the pitching is is obviously I mean, that was a bit of a loaded question mm-hmm. to you because I think we all know where it's at is I mean, their pitching was, I mean, SEC play last year, they had an ERA of nine and a half. I mean, that's just an unfathomably tough year on the mound. And and you made a good point about Scott Foxhall, like well-respected pitching coach. He will be a pitching coach again and he will be successful again, but sometimes things just get stale. You know, sometimes it's just time and you have to try something. So I I get the move and Justin Parker is well-respected in his own right. So Mm -hmm. it's a perfectly, perfectly reasonable move to make there. And, one of the interesting things about the team last year was that it, there was plenty of stuff on the staff and, you know, injuries depleted a little bit, but stuff wasn't really an issue. And I would say it wasn't even control, although walks and hit batters were a problem. Mm-hmm. But I think it was a, a command issue as much as anything else, because 
the strike zone in the SEC was smaller last year. I mean, I think that's right. the, the, the the data bears that out. And so if you're not able to throw quality strikes, or if you're not able to throw, you know, throw your fastball, you know, two balls links off of the plate, mm-hmm. um, if you can't execute those pitches, like in this league, you're gonna be in trouble. Like if, if you throwing strikes has to be throwing it over the fat heart of the fat part of the plate. That's that's a problem. And so it felt like a little bit of a command issue as much as a control issue with those guys. But I will say, if you're looking for optimism on the mound, it's not just a new pitching coach. Like I think the depth is pretty good here. Yeah. I thought yeah. I thought when they brought in Carson Ligon from Miami and Cal Steven from Purdue, I kind of thought, okay, well, those guys are probably going to plug right into the rotation. And, and actually, it looks like mm-hmm. maybe those guys won't necessarily. Could like they're looking pitch. more at Right. Yeah, it's looking more like you mentioned Dome and, and Sanja and Colby Holcomb, perhaps. And, yeah. you know, Ligon and Steven might be a midweek guy and a reliever, respectively, or vice versa. And then you add in Cam Schulke, a Juco transfer yeah. who was unhittable at the Juco level and, and over the Exciting summer. Exciting guy, right. And, yeah, in the, in the Cape Cod League. So I, I do like the depth pieces here. But but as a collective, I it doesn't it doesn't matter how they get there. It just has to be better. <laughs> like there's really no other way to put it. And mm-hmm. you know, defense was a bit of an issue last year too. Um, that ended up getting overshadowed ultimately by mm-hmm. how much the pitching can struggled struggled consistently. But you know, you talked to Chris Limonis in the fall, and and he was pretty optimistic about Logan Kohler as a defender mm-hmm. at third base. Uh, David Mershon returns to maybe play shortstop. He'll be battling with Dylan Cup, the freshman. But yeah. both of those guys have defensive skills yeah you know your outfield is is, right yeah the outfield's pretty athletic so i think that they will also be a little bit better defensively so you know you just kind of hope the the you know the offense is able to maintain that level and to me mark i'll I'll toss it to you on your thoughts here Mm -hmm. but i think one of the big keys offensively is you know dakota Dakota jordan had a really good second half last year the Mm -hmm. second half of the season he was excellent and you know his numbers it shows the trajectory he was on that his numbers in SEC play are actually better than they were overall, which is pretty rare. You know, typically it goes the other way, even for good hitter, you know, the best hitters. Mm -hmm. Um, If he picks up where he left off and elevates on that, we're talking about maybe an SEC player of the year type of guy. So can he do that? Or is there going to be some inconsistency where he, he kind of struggles to take that next step? Because as it is, he had a really nice year last year, but can he now be a guy that hits well over 300 and hits pushes, you know, 15, 18, 20 home runs, that, that kind of thing. Uh, You know, it's, it's more than you don't want to just put it on one person, but him being a superstar, I think would be, would be huge for this lineup alongside Hunter Hines, obviously. Yeah. Well, with Jordan, there's so much to like, right? I mean, he was, he was a clutch hitting machine. He hit a lot of, you know, tape measure home runs and things like that. So it's now it's time to elevate that and be consistent with it and, and take that next step. And all indications are he will, and especially with Hunter Hines hitting there, you know, whether one's hitting from the other, they're, they're going to be there to cushion each other. So that's, I mean, for, from a one, two punch, that's, that stacks up there with, with a lot of teams, right? I mean, who, there's not, not going to be a ton better than those two. And that gives you a chance. Now you need other guys around you to, to step forward and, and either be the, the guys that you knock in or be that lineup cushion or production uh, protection, all of those kinds of things. So, I mean, the question for me is, I mean, it's like the outfield. Okay. So we talked about Jordan. What's Bryce Chance going to give you? Uh, what's uh, who Jack going to give you? What what are they going to be able to do, you know, to to kind of elevate their games and be the the type of you know provide the type of production that Mississippi State needs, right? And then, you know, guy we talked about, Amani Larry, it was really good moments last year, just you know able to to, to be a really good stabilizing force uh, at the top of the lineup. Is is he going to continue to, to elevate, or maybe he just stays where he is, and maybe that's good enough, right? I mean, he was pretty good last year, but with he and Marshawn in the middle of the lineup, and then you got Cup, who's pushing both of them. If either of them kind of take a step back, you, you've got a guy who can come in and and you know step in as a freshman and play in the SEC, which 
I don't have to tell you how, how, how difficult that can be. And then we really haven't talked about Hunter Hines. I mean, he's he's as good a good a power stroke as you're going to find. I mean, he he's he's really challenging to pitch to. Uh, if you make a mistake, he hammers it. Um, I, I mean, he's a guy who could hit 25, 30 home runs this year if things go his way, or you know, if he doesn't, and people pitch around him, and there's nobody to to cushion the fall there. If you if you walk him. Maybe he doesn't hit that many, and he's having to chase. So I, I think a lot of his production is going to depend on what happens around him. And, uh, you know, and then going back to the pitching side, I really think Mississippi State has helped themselves from a depth standpoint. Uh, I don't know that, you know, there's that Friday guy that you're going to fear. Uh, maybe someone emerges. Maybe it's Dome. Maybe it's Sanja. Um, maybe it's it's Holcomb who was who was really good this fall. Who's one of the, you know, certainly he's improved as much as anybody. And there's there's Bradley Lofton who who had, who had moments last year, who has you know he's got a, his ceiling's really high. He could be the next one. Maybe one of those guys elevates and and is and is the Friday guy that Mississippi State hadn't had in a few years. And if that happens, then everybody else can kind of you know, slide down, slide down a notch and it's that much easier. All right. To pitch, you know, maybe you were pitching on Friday and now you're pitching on Saturday or Sunday and life, life is a lot easier that way. So I I think that's for Mississippi State, that's the combination, right? We we talked about, you know, Hines getting protection in the lineup, Dakota Jordan making that, continuing his ascension like he did at the end, end of last year and somebody, or maybe a couple of somebody's, elevating in that rotation and if that happens and everybody else can kind of find their find their role and find their sweet spot this is a team that i mean that their ceiling is is as high as anyone but their floor is kind of low because you you don't really know what some of these guys are going to do and that that makes them difficult to project and i think um it's going to make them a really fun team to watch um because they're going to be unpredictable from week to week uh, at least on paper, uh, until they uh, until they stabilize, and if they do, oh boy, uh, that that you know the dude be rocking, you know, come April and May, and maybe yeah, June. That, that, <laughs> yeah, 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 uh, yeah. The, the the variance in possible results for that team make it fun for uh, somebody like you and I, neutral observers. Right. Uh, for the fans, it might be a little bit. Uh, you know, yeah. it, make sure you're taking, make sure you're up to date on all your meds, you know, when you, <laughs> when you go to watch the team. One, one key I think here too is um, related to the pitching staff in a lot of ways is what they get at catcher. Uh, last year it yeah. was rough defensively and, yeah. you know, Ross Heifel kind of got thrown into a situation he probably wasn't totally ready for. And so, you know, what do they do there? Obviously, you know, I think they, they would like Heifel to be the guy because he's the best bat they have at catcher and the guy can really hit and he's got some tools defensively, but he's just not the most polished defender. And there is a scenario where you could move Heifel to a DH spot or something and you can Mm -hmm. catch Johnny Long, who's a veteran from Pitt, who's just like a, you know, a more polished traditional catcher, but you're probably not going to get as much offensively from John. I can just about guarantee you, you're not going to get as much offensively from Johnny Long. So I, I think in a perfect world, it's it's Highfield just really grabs the bull by the horns and um, you know is able to do everything for them there. But but that is regardless of who it is, that is something to watch because last year it it exacerbated existing issues on the mound that you know you were getting balls to the backstop and they couldn't throw anybody out on the bases and and so on and so forth. Yeah, that's that's an excellent point, and you know you do anticipate a jump from a freshman who had to go through and and go through all these learnings, right, into a sophomore who's who has this experience, who is certainly talented. So it's just a question of can he can he take the next step? And if he does, um, uh, defensively, uh, we're talking about if he does, then then they have the total package. If he only takes the next step offensively, then it's not the end of the world. You still DH him, and maybe somebody else can 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 come in and fill that need because. Unlike a lot of teams, Mississippi State doesn't have just a designated DH, right? Um, I think that's still to be determined who's going to be that guy. So, and I think through the course of the year, maybe many guys, uh, as they learn, 
you know, what that lineup is going to be. Um, I think the other thing that I want to point out is um, they have a freshman, Nolan Stevens, really highly regarded outfielder, um, could be, you know, one of the next guys, right? Is he ready to come in and play? If so, where? Um, it, you know, you get a guy like that who's, you know, if in the college baseball signee world would be a five-star prospect, you know, compared to football, um, just one of these elite, you know, prospects who comes in, can he, you know, can, can he push his way into the lineup and can he make it, make an impact as a freshman? If so, then that changes the math a little bit. We have someone every year, right? Uh, you know, Petrie came in last year. I mean, you, you look around the league, Cade, Cade Curlin for Florida, you know, was a really good freshman. Someone around the league is going to come in and kind of, you know, against the odds, flourish as a freshman. And may, maybe it's him. He's certainly talented enough. If not, maybe he comes on late in the year like Dakota Jordan is or did a year ago. So all of these different factors, and that's what makes Mississippi State such a fascinating team. A lot of reasons for optimism. And, you know, when you look at a, um, you know, a bulldog club that's kind of taken it, taking it on the chin, you know, a couple of years in a row, you look for reasons for optimism, and there are plenty. Uh, this is a better roster. Certainly a lot more pitching depth. Um, the offense has, you know, they have pieces that they can build around if, if certain things fall fall the way you want them to uh, in a positive fashion. It's going to be a really good offense as well. So I, I think, you know, this is a team, you know, we, we've talked about this with a few teams now. They could be anywhere from hosting a regional to missing Hoover. And, and I do think that, you know, there's a really wide swing, and it's going to depend on all, you know, m- many of those things that we've already mentioned. Yeah, it should be. I mean, that's the, the results for Mississippi State are going to be a storyline all season, no matter how it goes. So that's just kind of mm-hmm. the, the state of play when you talk about a team that won a national title and then has finished basically in a cellar two years in a row. It's going to be fascinating to to follow all year long. And, and you're right that there is a a pretty wide variance. So we'll I think we'll be. Um, both surprised and not surprised by how things end up, I think. Because there, there's going to be some things we're not anticipating, but then whatever result it is, is probably going to be a result that we look back on and say like, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Um, so we'll, we will obviously have to see how it all shakes out. That is going to do it for this edition of Highway to Hoover, a production of SEC Extra over at d1baseball.com. If you're a Mississippi State fan who just parachuted in for this one episode, we first of all, we appreciate you listening. But stick around. Uh, get to know your enemies a little bit and, and stick around as we record um, you know, an episode for all 14 SEC clubs. Go back and listen to the first seven of these we did um, before we got to Mississippi State just to get caught up on every team in the SEC ahead of 2024 opening day. But regardless, Bulldog fans, we appreciate you listening today. Uh, so thank you for listening. Thank you, as always, to Pitch Logic for sponsoring this and every highway to Hoover. And thank you to Mark, as always, 